Most of the textbooks or other sources start this chapter first by explaining what the momentum is and then move to impulse. I personally find it easier first to learn what the impulse is and then understand the momentum based on impulse. We will follow this approach in this video series as well. Let's consider a situation where we have some paper clips and a strong magnet. What will happen if we slowly move the magnet over these paper clips? Paper clips will be attracted by the magnet and attached to it. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the experiment. We have the same paper clips and the same magnet. But this time, the magnet passes over the paper clips very fast. Even though there is still the same attraction force between the magnet and paper clips, there is simply not enough time for these objects to interact with each other properly. Now, let's have a look on another example. We have an empty bottle on the screen, which is covered by a ruler. A coin has been placed on a ruler and its position is just above the opening of the bottle. While trying to slowly pull the ruler, we notice that the coin is also pulled in the same direction with it. Even though the coin wants to keep its state of rest due to its inertia, the friction force between the ruler and coin pulls it to the right. Let's repeat the same experiment, but this time we pull the ruler rapidly. This time, even though there is still the friction force between the ruler and the coin, we didn't give the ruler enough time to move the coin. The coin remains in its position, and once the ruler is pulled, the coin falls in the bottle due to gravity. These two examples show us that the time of impact of a force on an object is as important as the amount of that force. The physical quantity representing this relation is called an impulse. Impulse is the product of the resultant force acting on an object and the time this force acts on the object. Impulse is a vector quantity, meaning in the exams we have to specify its direction as well. It is always acting in the direction of the net force. Impulse is equal to the product of the net force and time. Unit of force is Newton and the unit of time is second. Therefore, unit of impulse is Newton times second. Unit of impulse can also be written as kilograms meters per second. We are going to learn where does it comes in the upcoming videos. We represent a force by symbol F time by symbol t. How do we represent an impulse? In classical mechanics, an impulse is symbolized by J or IMP. But in Capsalan syllabus, there is no symbol for impulse. To represent it, we just write word impulse or F net times delta t. We can finish this video by solving a simple example. A force of 30 newtons acting east is pulling an object for 20 seconds. Calculate the magnitude of the impulse imparted on the object. Impulse is equal to net force times acceleration. The net force exerted on the object is 30 newtons and the time of impact is 20 seconds. Impulse imparted on the object is equal to 600 newtons times seconds. Let's imagine an object moving on a surface with an initial velocity of vi under an influence of a net force. After a certain time interval delta t, the velocity of the object will become vf for v final. We can recall that the impulse applied on this object is equal to net force times delta t. According to the second law of motion, net force can be written as mass times acceleration of the object. And acceleration 
is the change in the velocity of an object in a unit time. Delta t's in this equation will cancel each other. As a result, impulse, which is f net times delta t, is equal to mass times delta v. As we know, delta means final value minus initial value of any quantity. In this case, it will be the final velocity minus initial velocity. If we distribute mass inside the parentheses, impulse will be equal to mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. The expression mass times velocity in this equation is known as the momentum of an object. If we are going to write down the formula on the screen in a words, we get the definition of the momentum. Momentum of an object is equal to the product of the mass and velocity of the object. Momentum is also a vector quantity and it is acting always in the direction of the velocity of an object. Unit of the momentum is same as the unit of an impulse. It is kilogram meters per second or newton times second. Now let's show a couple of simple examples about momentum. In the first example, we are asked to calculate the momentum of a car of a mass of 1000 kgs moving east at a velocity of 8 meters per second. In a capsule and exams, this time of questions are generally for three marks. The first mark is for writing the correct formula, the second one for correct substitution, and the last one is for the correct answer. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity, where mass is 1000 kgs and the velocity of an object is 8 meters per second. Momentum is equal to 8000 kilogram meters per second. We are not done yet as momentum is a vector quantity, so we have to specify the direction of momentum as well. Momentum of the object is always in the direction of the velocity. Object moves east, so direction of the momentum is also east. In the next question, we are asked to calculate the magnitude of the change in the momentum of a car of mass 1200 kilograms if its velocity has been increased from 15 meters per second to 25 meters per second. We start solving the equation by typing a formula. Change in the momentum is delta p, which means final momentum minus initial momentum of an object. Momentum of an object is equal to mass times velocity. Mass of the object is 1200 kgs. Final velocity is 25 meters per second. And initial velocity is 15 meters per second. Change in the momentum is equal to 12,000 kilogram meters per second. Net force multiplied by the time of impact is equal to mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. The quantity which is equal to the product of the mass and the velocity of an object is called momentum. So this expression is equal to final minus initial momentums. In physics, the difference of final and initial values of any quantity can be represented by symbol delta. Therefore, we can bring the two ends of this long line together and write as a single equation. Product of the net force and the impact time is equal to the change in the momentum of an object. After some altering with this formula, we find out that the net force is equal to the ratio of change in the momentum and the change in the time, delta p over delta t. By doing so, we are able to get another definition for the second law of motion. The resultant or net force acting on the object is equal or we can say is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum of an object. At least at the time of recording this video, it is not necessary to add in the exam the last part of the definition, which is in the direction of the force. But especially in trial papers, we may never know 
for which part of the definition we can get the mark. Hence, it will be better if we add this part as well. According to this formula, if time of contact increases, the net force experienced by an object decreases. This expression is the key phrase in questions related to the applications of the second law of motion in daily life. That's why we have to try to understand it properly. Now, let's solve a couple of examples to understand how to use this formula. In the first example, a rubber ball of mass 0.8 kg is dropped and strikes the floor with an initial velocity of 6 meters per second. It bounces back with a final velocity of 4 m per second. We have to calculate the impulse applied on the ball by the floor. As always, we start solving a question by writing a formula. As in most cases, doing so is getting us one mark. Net force multiplied by time is equal to the change in the momentum, which is also equal to mass times final velocity minus initial velocity. We must make sure that we start with the first part of this equation. It is this part which will get us a mark. If we write just the second part of the equation, no mark will be allocated, as it is formula to calculate the change of momentum only. Maybe it doesn't make sense, as impulse is already equal to the change of the momentum, but this is the way Memos for our exams are working. Just before striking the floor, the ball was moving downwards, and after bouncing, it is moving upwards. Impulse and momentum is one of the topics where, unless it is already specified in the question, we are required to specify which direction is positive and which direction is negative. For this question, Let's choose upwards as a positive direction. In this case, the final velocity will have value of positive 4 and initial velocity is going to be minus 6. Mass of the ball is 0.8 kg. Impulse of the object is 8 kg meters per second. Positive result means the direction of the impulse applied on the ball is upwards. In the second example, a bullet of mass 10 grams, traveling east at 500 meters per second, strikes the block and passes straight through it with a constant acceleration. It emerges from the block at a velocity of 200 meters per second. We can ignore any loss of mass of the bullet. If the bullet takes 0.002 seconds to travel through the block, Calculate the net force experienced by the bullet during this time interval. In this type of questions, where we have a lot of text and which can confuse us a lot, it is a good idea first to draw a diagram or a picture of what is going on. There are two sides of story in this question. Before bullet strikes the block and after it emerges from the block. Hence, let's split the diagram into two parts before and after. Initially, mass of the bullet is 10 grams and its velocity is 500 meters per second. Afterwards, the mass of the bullet is still 10 grams but its velocity now is 200 meters per second. As bullet is moving only east, let's choose it as a positive direction. We are asked to calculate the net force Therefore, we start the solution with the newly learned equation of the second law of motion. Net force is equal to the ratio of the change in the momentum and time of impact. Delta P can be written as mass times V final minus V initial. As unit of mass, we use kilograms. So, 10 grams will be written as 0.01 kgs. We can recall that 1 gram is 1000 times smaller than a kilogram. Final velocity is 200 and initial velocity is 500 meters per second. The bullet passes the block in 0.002 seconds. Net force applied on the bullet by the block 
is minus 3000 newtons. Getting a negative answer means that the magnitude of the force is 3000 newtons but its direction is west. In exams, we can come across questions like what is the importance of an airbag or seat belt or crumple zones of a car or bending our knees while landing. For all these questions, we are going to give almost the same answer. While defining the second law of motion in the previous video, we have mentioned that if the time of impact or contact increases, the net force exerted on an object decreases. Answers for all the questions above are based on this piece of information. As a safety precaution, all vehicles must have seat belts and airbags installed on them. In an accident, airbag or seat belts increases the contact time and decreases the net force acting on the person according to the physical principle F is equal to delta P over delta T. There are three key phrases here which we have to mention in the exam to get full mark. The first one is increases the contact time or time of impact. The second key phrase is decreases the net force. And the last one is according to the physical principle F is equal to delta P over delta T. Sometimes we see a car after an accident with its front or backside completely or mostly deformed. We immediately think what a bad accident can make the car to be deformed so much? The front and back sides of a car are called crumple or crumpling zones. In reality, these zones are parts of a vehicle designed to deform and crumple in case of a collision. This absorbs some of the energy of the impact, preventing it from being transmitted to the occupants of the car. As we can notice, the only part in this expression on the screen which differs from the previous one is that the phrase airbags or seatbelts has been replaced by a crumpling zone. While we are landing after a jump, by design our body tries to bend the knees and we mostly don't even notice it or give it any importance. But that small action saves us from a lot of pain and harm. Bending the knees when a person lands after jumping increases the contact time and decreases the net force acting on the person according to the physical principle F is equal to delta P over delta T. Otherwise, we could easily broke our knees and legs due to the huge amount of the force applied on them. Of course, the result depends on the height from which we land as well. In physics, while learning a new topic, to simplify the process, first we try to learn it within ideal conditions. And then, step by step, we start to introduce all other parameters. We have followed the same methodology in the topic of loss of motion. While solving the first examples of that topic, initially we were ignoring the friction force and had started to consider it only towards the end of the topic. This way, we were able to lay a base understanding of the topic and then add other building blocks on the base knowledge. The system with ideal conditions for this topic is an isolated system. There are a lot of different definitions of an isolated system. Actually, there are even two different types of an isolated system. Simply put, isolated system in thermodynamics is the system where energy does not change. In mechanics, it is the system where total momentum of the system does not change. As our topic is not thermodynamics, we will focus on the second definition of an isolated system. Isolated system is a system that has no net external force acting on it. Since there is no net external force acting on the system, the momentum of the system remains constant. For example, on the screen we can see two objects which are moving towards each other, collide and then move in opposite directions. If we ignore the friction force between the surface and the objects, as well as all kind of energy transfers between these two, 
We can say that the system is an isolated system. In reality, there is always friction force between a surface and an object, or there is always heat exchange between two objects colliding with each other. Due to collision, these objects become hotter, which means some part of the mechanical energy is transferred to a heat energy, or sometimes even to a sound energy. But again, for the simplicity, we are ignoring all of them and assume that the system is isolated. The question may arise, why we have focused on an isolated system so much? The reason is the law of conservation of linear momentum. According to this law, in an isolated system, total linear momentum remains same. Here, we say total linear momentum as in a caps-aligned physics class, we only learn about linear momentums, which means all objects in our examples are moving on the same line. But this definition is true for all kinds of momentums. According to the definition, total linear momentum of a system in its initial state is equal to the total linear momentum of the system in its final state. On the animation on the screen, we can see a Newton's cradle. Initially, five balls on the right are at rest, only the leftmost ball is moving. Therefore, the total momentum of the system is equal to the momentum of this lonely ball. After collision, the ball on the left stops and the rightmost one moves to the right with the same velocity as the first ball had just before the collision. And now, total linear momentum is equal to the momentum of the rightmost ball as others are at rest. In an ideal conditions, this motion continues back and forth indefinitely. But in real life, due to loss of mechanical energy and friction, after a while, the motion is going to stop. Let's show an example to see how to use the given formula. A 5 kg explosive object which is at rest on a smooth plane fragments into two pieces of masses 3 kg and 2 kg after an internal explosion. If the 2 kg piece moves due east at a speed of 6 meters per second, what is the velocity of the other piece? Sometimes it may be difficult to understand the question. In these cases, it is always a good idea to draw a diagram or a picture. Initially, a 5 kg object is at rest. Then, it fragments into two pieces, a 2 kg part which moves east at a velocity of 6 m per second and 3 kg one. But we don't know what the velocity of that piece is. Calculating it is our task for this question. First, we type the formula total initial linear momentum is equal to the total final linear momentum. Then, we decide on positive and negative directions. For this question, we choose east as positive. Initially, there is a single object of mass m and velocity v. Afterwards, there are two pieces of masses m1 and m2 and velocities of v1 and v2 respectively. Mass of initial object is 5 kg and its velocity is 0, as the object was at rest. M1 Mass of the piece on the right is 2 kg and its velocity is 6 m per second. Second piece is 3 kg and its velocity is unknown yet. By solving the equation, we calculate that the velocity of the 3 kg piece is negative 4 m per second. The answer has a negative value, meaning the 3 kg object is moving west. Therefore, velocity of 3 kg object is 4 meters per second west. Collisions can be elastic or inelastic. We will learn about the elastic collision in this video and the inelastic collision in the following. An elastic collision is a collision where total momentum and total kinetic energy are both conserved. The preceding videos taught us that the system's total initial and total final linear momentums are equal according to the law of conservation of linear momentum. We can also 
adapt this equation to include kinetic energies for elastic collisions. The total kinetic energy of the system, both at the beginning and at the end, is the same. Although we can't actually say a perfect elastic collision, since there is always some kinetic energy loss. The collision of pull balls can be regarded as such because the energy loss in this instance is negligible enough to be ignored. Ball P of mass 0.2 kgs collides head-on with another ball Q of mass 0.3 kilograms, as shown in the diagram below. Ignore the effects of friction and the rotational effects of the balls. Part A. Calculate the velocity of the ball Q after the collision. Two diagrams can be seen on the screen, one showing the balls soon before the collision and the other showing the conditions just after it. We can treat this system as an isolated system since we can ignore friction and other influences on these balls. In this case, we can start the answer by typing the equation stating that the total linear momentums before and after the collision are equal. Let's consider east as a positive direction. There are two objects that are moving independently both before and after the collision. Thus, the initial equation can be modified to say that the sums of the initial momentums of the balls P and Q equal the sums of their final momentums. The ball P's initial mass is 0.2 kgs and its initial velocity is 15 meters per second. The ball Q has a mass of 0.3 kilograms and a velocity of 5 meters per second rest. The mass of P is still 0.2 kilograms after the collision, but it is now heading west at a velocity of 9 meters per second. So the velocity of P after the collision is minus 9. Q has a mass of 0.3 kgs and we must determine its velocity following the collision. 3 minus 1.5 is equal to minus 1.8 plus 0.3 times velocity of Q. As a result, velocity of the ball Q after the collision is 11 meters per second. The ball is traveling east because the result is a positive number. In the second part of this question, we have to find out if this collision is elastic or no, and then we have to give explanation to our answer. We already mentioned that the total kinetic energy is conserved in an elastic collision. Therefore, we must compute the total kinetic energy before and after the impact. Then, compare the results to determine if the collision is elastic or not. The collision is elastic if the solutions match, else it is not. Kinetic energy, as we all know, is 1 over 2 times the product of mass and the square of the speed. Kinetic energy of the ball P before the collision is 1 over 2 times its mass 0.2 kgs multiplied by square of its velocity 15. Kinetic energy of the ball Q is 1 over 2 times 0.3 times square of minus 5. The total kinetic energy of objects before the collision is 26.25 joules. Kinetic energy of P after the collision is 1 over 2 times 0.2 times square of minus 9. And the kinetic energy of Q is 1 over 2 times 0.3 times square of 11. These two add out to 26.25 joules as well. We can see that the total amount of kinetic energies before and after the collision are equal. The collision is hence elastic. As we recall, an elastic collision is one in which both total kinetic energy and total linear momentums are conserved. If a collision is inelastic, the total linear momentum in an isolated system remains same, but the kinetic energy changes. Some of the initial kinetic energy is converted into other forms of energy during the collision, such as heat or sound energy. 
Following an elastic collision, each object in the system moves independently. In an inelastic collision, the items may move independently or together. The players are seen colliding and moving together in an image on the screen. As a result, this collision is definitely inelastic. In conclusion, a collision is wholly inelastic if, following a collision, all of the system's objects move together. If they move independently, we must perform additional computations to determine if the collision is elastic or inelastic. A car of mass 1650 kg traveling at a velocity of 25 meters per second to the left collides head on with a minibus of mass 3050 kg traveling at 15 meters per second to the right. The two vehicles move together as a unit in a straight line after the collision. First part of the question, calculate the velocity of the two vehicles after the collision. The diagram on the screen effectively illustrates the conditions both before and after the collision. We start by typing the equation for the log of conservation of momentum in order to answer the question. Total linear momentums prior to the collision and following it are same. Next, we decide on right direction as a positive one. We have two moving objects before the collision and each of them has its own momentum. The formula for the momentum of the minibus can be written as mass of the minibus times velocity of the minibus. And the momentum of the car is mass of the car times its velocity. Even though we still have a minibus and a car after the collision, they now travel as a single object with a total mass equal to the sum of the masses of the minibus and the car and a velocity of v. Mass of the minibus is 3050 kilograms and its velocity is 15 meters per second. Mass of the car is 1650 kg and its velocity is minus 25 meters per second as it is moving to the left. 4500 is equal to 4700 times v. Velocity is equal to 0.96 meters per second. The minibus and car will move to the right because the answer has a positive value. In the second part of the question, we must prove that the collision is inelastic. To do this, we must first compute the total kinetic energy prior to and following the collision, and then we must compare them. Before the collision, the kinetic energy of the minibus is 1 over 2 times 3050 times square of 15. The kinetic energy of the car is 1 over 2 times 1650 times square of 25. These two added together equal to 858,750 joules. Following the collision, the minibus and the car move together as a one unit. As a result, their kinetic energy is equal to 1 over 2 times the total of the two vehicle's masses 3050 plus 1650 multiplied by the square of the two vehicle's post-collision velocity 0.96. The final value is 2165.76 joules. As is obvious, these two values are different from one another. This results in a difference in the total kinetic energy before and after the collision. Therefore, this collision is an inelastic one. A car of mass m traveling at a velocity of 20 meters per second east collides head-on and stick together with a truck of mass 2m traveling at 20 meters per second west. The two vehicles move together as a unit in a straight line after the collision. Calculate the velocity of the truck car system immediately after the collision. Vehicles before and after the crash are illustrated in the diagrams on the screen. We must remember that each vehicle was traveling on its own before the crash. After the collision, they are traveling together. The equation for the conservation of linear momentum is the first step in the answer to this question.
before and after the collision, the total linear momentum remains same. Let it be stated upfront that we consider heading east as a positive direction. As we previously discussed, since vehicles move independently at first, each one has its own momentum, which can be calculated as the product of an object's mass and velocity. Following the collision, both vehicles move as one unit with a combined mass equal to that of the car and the truck. Mass of the car is m and its velocity is 20 meters per second. Mass of the truck is 2 times m and its velocity is 20 meters per second as well, but it is heading west. Following a collision, the mass of the two cars moving together is equal to m plus 2 m's. We are asked to calculate their velocity after the collision. Minus 20 times m is equal to 3 m times velocity. Velocity of the car truck system immediately after the collision is negative 6.67 meters per second. The outcome is negative, so we add an extra step to the solution to specify the magnitude of the velocity as 6.67 meters per second and the direction as west. Object P of mass 500 kg moving east collides head on with object Q of mass 250 kg traveling at a constant velocity of 5 meters per second west before the collision. The graph shows how the momentum of object P changed with time just before and just after the collision. In the first part of the question, we must calculate the magnitude of the velocity of object P just before the collision. On the graph, we can see that between the time intervals of 10.1 and 10.2 seconds, the momentum of object P changed dramatically. The collision occurs within this period of time. The momentum of object P is 15,000 kg per second before the collision. As usual, we begin by writing the equation to find the solution. Mass times the object's velocity equals momentum. 15,000 is equal to 500 times V. Prior to the collision, P was moving at a velocity of 30 meters per second. There is no need to provide direction in our answer because we are only asked to calculate the magnitude of the velocity. The second part of the question asks us to determine object Q's velocity immediately after the collision. According to the conservation of the linear momentum, the total linear momentums before and after the collision are equal. We had two objects with individual momentums before the collision. We can see that even after the collision, these two objects are traveling separately because the question asks us to determine the velocity of object Q. P has an initial momentum of 15,000, while Q has an initial momentum equal to its mass times velocity, 250 multiplied by a negative 5. The direction that we consider as positive is not specified. How then can we know that Q's starting velocity is negative? According to the question, Object P was initially traveling east, and its initial momentum has a positive value on the graph. This shows that east has already been selected as the positive direction in the question. Westward direction will be considered as negative in this situation. Following the collision, Object P's momentum is 7000, and Object Q's momentum is 250 times its final velocity. It is equal to 27 meters per second. Positive result indicates that following the impact, object Q is traveling east. The magnitude of the net average force acting on object P during the collision must be calculated for the final part of this question. Because the net force applied on the objects during the collision does not remain constant, the phrase net average force was used instead of just net force. At the high school level, 
we are only considering the average value of the net force to make things simple. The second law of motion states that the net force exerted on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Delta is the final value minus the initial value of any quantity. Therefore, the equation can be expressed as final momentum minus starting momentum over final time minus initial time. The collision occurred between the seconds 10.1 and 10.2, where 10.1 is the starting time and 10.2 is the ending one. The momentum of P is 7000 at 10.2 seconds and 15000 at 10.1 seconds. As a result, the net force is equal to minus 80,000 kg meter per second. In the case of a negative answer, we always write the positive value and direction of any vector quantity. Thus, the net force is equal to 80,000 kg per second. Despite the fact that we are not asked to indicate the direction and the question only asks for the force's magnitude, determining it will be helpful for learning purposes. Because the net force we calculated is negative, it is acting west. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications in order to be updated about the new videos.